Hi everyone, I am Kimberly, the 5 Minute NP. The 5 Minute NP was born out of my belief that small incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5 Minute NP Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to the 5 Minute NP Podcast. In today's episode, Nikki Blakeman from the UK, a qualified adult sleep coach, former insomnia sufferer, and a mom to three, joins us to discuss the negative impact that lack of sleep has on our health and longevity. She discusses how sleep affects our hormones, our moods, and ability to be productive in our work and business. In addition, she discusses why sleep is neglected and ways to get more sleep. If you want to live a longer, healthier, and happier life, tune in to this episode and get more sleep. Welcome to the 5-Minute MP Podcast. Hi, Nikki. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. What's the weather like over there in the UK? It's not bad. We're not doing too bad. Bit of rain, but quite warm for our summer. (laughs) How about you? It's it's raining today. So you're probably used to the rain, huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Do you guys really get that much rain? Yeah, we really do. We really do. Well, uh, what we get is an inability to know when it's going to rain. So an inability to plan, right, is what our summer is like. So you can't invite people over like three weeks on Saturday. Forget it. Oh my God. <laughs> it may or may not be raining. <laughs> I mean, is everybody on like vitamin D supplements over there? Yeah, we, we funnily enough, like, uh, yeah, as a side tangent, yeah, we do have, um, we do have a kind of, yeah, an issue with, with, yeah, with that and with children particularly, yes, yeah, and as our, children go more towards you know sitting inside on computers and stuff like that yeah I have read that that there's a bit of a bit of a thing yeah but wow yeah I mean we we suffer with that through the winter but yeah I can imagine over there everybody's probably deficient in vitamin d um well I am so excited to talk about sleep today and it's one thing that I think people really neglect when it comes to health And I know I did for many years. I mean, my relationship, my bad relationship with sleep really started in childhood. You know, my mom worked night shift and, you know, I would be at babysitter's houses. I'd get picked up through the night and, you know, never on a good schedule. And that just played over into adulthood. Um, I became a nurse. I was working night shift or evening shift. And it also spilled over into how I raised my kids. I mean, I was, I almost had sleep envy of people that would be like, oh, you know, little Johnny's asleep at 730. And then we have the whole evening to ourselves. And I was like, what is that even like, you know, still to this day, literally, it's like <laughs> my kids, everybody's asleep and it's like 10 o'clock and it's like the party is just getting started. And so the more I've learned about sleep and how it impacts health. Um, the more I'm on them about sleep and getting rid of technology. And I just got to tell you, I spent years with anxiety and fear that it was just compounded through the night without sleep. Um, I was anxious about wanting to stay healthy, live longer. I was so afraid that something was going to happen to me. You know, I lost both of my parents young. I've talked about that in the past. And Yet I didn't really realize that the one thing that had the power to help me live longer and healthier was getting more sleep. I wasn't prioritizing the one thing that, you know, was actually aging me faster and making me sicker. So that's just a little bit about why I started to dive into sleep and the impact of sleep on health. And that's why I feel like it is so important that we really get the message out that no, it's, I'm going to say, and, and I will see if you agree with me that above exercise, above eating right, sleep is the one thing that can impact your health the most. And uh, would you agree with that? I, I would definitely agree that it, that it's at least equal to those things. Yeah. So everything that I've read about sleep is that, it's a it's another pillar it's eating right it's sleeping well it's hydrating it's exercising we can't have 
one of those, you know, we can't be not having one of those and expect our life to be healthy. As you said, it's, it's a complete package, but it's sleep is the one thing that we least think about. Yeah, I, I, I think it is the one thing I neglected for most of my life and still, I still struggle with it, you know? Well, I just want to start with you. Can you tell me a little bit about your personal story and why you became a sleep coach? Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to like really be very similar to what you just said, to be honest. So it's really interesting listening to you talk about it because it's, you know, it's a variation of my story. So when I was younger, I did sleep well, but as soon as I had the children, obviously I had three children. So I was pregnant, obviously that gave me pregnancy insomnia and then nursing and then pregnant again and then nursing again. I had my children in quick succession and then I had toddlers and waking in the night and all of that rest of it. So my sleep journey really began when all of that kind of good stuff happened with having the children. And then I just thought, well, do you know, as soon as the children start sleeping through, I'm, my sleep is going to regain just back to normal and I'll go back to being that great sleeper that I always was but it just didn't happen so one day I just woke up and I was like actually do you know what the kids have slept well for quite a long time now and and I and I'm not and it didn't come back like I thought that it would um so what is it about sleep that's so important and why do you feel like it is neglected by so many people So, I mean, this is the thing, you know, there's so much good stuff about sleep, but really to help you understand it, like simply sleep is basically just a time where we rest, we repair, we regenerate, we recuperate from all the stuff we've done in the day. And I think that most people kind of know that, but don't really understand just how much of that or just to what extent that is actually happening when we sleep. And we still quite culturally, at least in in the West, Western cultures, we more tend to think about sleep as an absence of of activity, as a kind of a restful period where not much is going on. And what I always explain to people is when we're active in the day all the time, there's loads of stuff that the body isn't doing and can't do while we're awake. It can only do when we're asleep. And so sleep is so important because those tasks have to be done and for every hour that we're awake we're accruing tasks that need to be done that have to get done in the night time and can only get done in the night time so there are some processes that physically don't operate while we're awake there are some cells and some processes in cells that have double functions so they're doing something else while we're awake so they have we have to be asleep for them to switch over and start doing these other functions and how i try to explain it to people is Imagine if you, okay, imagine if you just moved somewhere and I say to you, great, why don't you have a big like neighborhood party and invite your neighbors over and you're like, okay, great. That sounds fun. I'm going to clean all my house. I'm going to pull lots of food out. I'm going to get some drink. I'm going to get everything sorted. I'm going to invite everybody over and everybody comes over for like a big afternoon party. Well, while you're hosting the party, there's loads of stuff that you're not doing because you're in host mode. So imagine everybody comes and greets you. Maybe they all give you a gift and you're like, oh, thanks. I'll just put that there. And then, you know, have some food and you're serving food and you're going around with drinks and you're not, you're not washing up, right? Because you're greeting the guests and all of that. And so when the party's over in the afternoon and everybody goes home, you look around and you're like, oh my goodness me, right? There's like, there plates everywhere and there's food everywhere and there's the gifts kind of that are in a pile that you need to kind of now sort out and and then you know because they're your new neighbors like maybe they all told you their names and so you're like okay I must go and write down all these names and all the family names so that when I send Christmas cards to the neighbors I'm going to get the right names and all that kind of stuff so that's exactly what it's like in the day when we're in day mode there's loads of stuff that we're doing where we can't stop to do that tidy up job as we go so that's how i ask people to imagine it imagine if you're just hosting a party and you're you're in party mode for the whole time and then when the party's over you have to do all that cleanup so imagine now it's an evening and you're doing all that party cleanup and then i say to you hey guess what kim you're gonna have another party tomorrow for another new set of neighbors and then <laughs> and then 
you know, you say, okay, fine, but oh no, I, I haven't got time to tidy up. Oh. Then you say, okay, fine, um, I've, I've got to get everything ready, but you don't quite have time to clean up. Now the next day, when you invite all a set of new guests for the party, imagine that. There's still bits of food waste everywhere. There's dirty plates. Now the guests don't know, um, is that a pile of clean plates? Is that dirty plates? Is this food from today? Is this food from tomorrow? The, the party just doesn't go well, like the second party. And right. then you've got a whole load of new people in and you've got to now learn those names. But you hadn't wrote down the names from yesterday. So now you're forgetting the new neighbors' names because you hadn't wrote down, do you see? So yeah, the second party is never gonna be as good now because you didn't tidy up from the first party. And I know it's a really random analogy, but I, I hope it really helps to understand that you have to complete the task every night. You, you can't just skip it. You can't leave the party detritus to Saturday to clean it all up then when you have a lie in. It, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You have to go through your task in the day. You have to clean up every night and you have to be fresh, ready for the next day. That, that's the best analogy I can give to all of the activities as a, as a broad what sleep is doing. So on a cellular level, a physiological level, what are the benefits of sleep? So what sleep is doing is it's repairing. So at cellular level, it's taking out waste out of a lot of the cells, particularly in the brain, because the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system. So it's really important to clear out the waste products in the brain. It's also doing, yeah, repair. Certain immune system functions are done at night, for example. So that's a really an, another good, important thing. And on a mental level, lots and lots and lots of stuff is going on. So we're doing memory consolidation in the night. We're doing um, emotional consolidation. So particularly if we've had like negative things happening in the day, that's all going on at night. Um, and we're really like re just resetting everything ready for the next day. So we're closing off the tasks for this day and then resetting everything ready for the next day. Um, you're right, growth is another one. So this is why sleep is particularly important for children because you're doing, you know, your, your major growth effort is at night. And so it's really important to make sure you get that when you're in that period of growing. Um, I think it's interesting you brought that up because yes, when we have, when we're children, we have human growth hormone, it's being produced at a rapid rate. But as we get older, the human growth hormone decreases and what human growth hormone to me, what I think about is our youthful hormone. It's um, our muscle sparing hormone. I mean, that's what kind of keeps us young, keeps us yeah. healthy. Yeah. Um, so as we get older, not only are we not producing as much, but by sleeping that just impacts it even further. So therefore it's aging us faster. Um, so it, learning it, that yeah. was huge for me. Um, let's talk about melatonin. I mean, everybody knows melatonin is the sleep hormone. Um, can you talk about the benefits and how melatonin impacts us? Yeah. So melatonin, you're right. So melatonin is a sleep hormone, or one of them in that naturally, as we get towards the time when we should be sleeping, the melatonin level rises. And that's one of the things or the major thing that contributes to us feeling sleepy. So most of us do get that sensation as we're approaching nighttime. And as we've been awake for a number of hours in the day, we start to feel sleepy. So for most of us, we're getting that trigger to some extent. And that's, and that's in large part to the melatonin, which is a hormone which starts circulating when that's the case. Um, so to get melatonin to kick in at a certain time, what are things that can be done to get us on that cycle? Is it getting out early in the morning, getting some sunlight, and then, you know, in the evening again? Uh, how does that play into getting our melatonin to kick in at the right time? Yeah, so you're right, so you touched on this. I mean, how I get clients to think about it in the, in the first place is, imagine the difference between our current lifestyle you know 24 7 switched on technological lifestyle where you know most of us live in some kind of city that never sleeps you know metaphorically based on a more traditional um 
you know, going back a lot of years, to be fair, not going back an awful lot of years because we've only had sort of electric light in, in homes for, for most people around 100 years or more. So it's not that long ago. But when you think of kind of original tribal communities where we're living outside, we are completely aware of what time of day and night it is. And our eyes are getting that data really clearly. So like you were just mentioning about vitamin D earlier on, it's just, and with sunlight, and now we're inside a lot more and we don't get that. So it's exactly the same thing with light. We think because we're inside a lit room that it's sufficient. It's not really. So we're, it's not necessarily sufficient. So because we're not outside as much and because we then have electric light in the evening, which brings light in, Mm -hmm. we're not giving those clear signals so yes you're right anything really which helps to give more clear signals to our body about when it's daytime and when it's nighttime and you're right there are studies which have shown that if you make a conscious effort to not just get up and sit in a lit room but actually get outside and start mm -hmm. to get that actual sunlight in, in, into your eyes so to speak and I was like looking at the sun obviously don't do that but get exposure to, to actual outside daylight then yeah it really reinforces the body is looking for and this is not just in case of sleep this is in case of loads of things which i'm sure that you talk about on other on other episodes it, the body's always looking for cycles it's always looking for routine your know, seasonal cycles day cycles it's the same we're, we're we're looking for that pattern and we want to keep the pattern mm -hmm. and actually what's really interesting if you're interested in this what they discovered was if you take humans down into underground where they get no night and day we don't actually fully run on a 24 hour cycle our, our natural day that we sink on our body clock is slightly off of the 24 hour clock hmm. so we actually do need the cues to make us understand when it is the next day and the 24 hours and keep it routine so we're not totally like automaton in the sense that we would just operate we kind of do but not totally so the you shouldn't underestimate the fact that our our brain does need that kind of daily check and balance as like okay yeah i think it's morning yeah okay it is morning okay i think it's evening yeah okay it is evening i just reinforcing that reminder and that setting that internal body clock so yeah really what we want to do in terms of melatonin is we want to start putting things around the day which just reinforce those things in the day like i say so you're right if you have a routine where you get up at the same time you get out into the outdoors to get the light and then you start to tone down light at the same time every day then your body's going to, it's going to really support your body to understand this is the 24 hour clock that I'm working to. And this is when I should get the melatonin ready and producing. So we really can do a lot to support our bodies. What most of us tend to do though, is just constantly give our bodies totally confusing signals that it was just never meant to have. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like we're really natural, you know, we're really supposed to be in tune with nature. Our body's supposed to work like that. And we literally fight it. I know I did. Yeah, we do. And, and it doesn't take much of you, unfortunately. And uh, when I work with clients, what I find is a lot of them are quite amazed at how, despite us being a generally sophisticated species, and obviously a very sort of highly intelligent species mm -hmm. are sleep mechanisms because they're presumably because they have origins in very old evolution are really, really, really basic and really easily thrown off. And it's not complicated. And I think when I start to talk to clients about sleep, I think they think I'm going to go into like a really big medical explanation of sleep. And I'm like, yeah, basically you're just going to convince it when it's day, when it's night, how long I've been awake. How much sleep do I need? It's really simple. And I, and I do think that shocks people at how, you know, much we are still run off these very basic kind of evolutionary processes. Um, so with the melatonin, um, is it important for melatonin to be released that we're in complete darkness? Because I've heard it's important to sleep in the dark. And is it because that helps melatonin be released? So, um, well, there's two things here. So, like I said, like years ago, obviously, we would have been seeing, excuse me, please could you leave the room or could you be very quiet? Thank you. Um, 
So previously, um, we would have been, as I say, if we were in a tribal community, if we were living outdoors, we don't really need any other information other than what we've got. So we've got day and night, it's very obvious, and we can totally keep in tune with it. Obviously here, we're confusing that by using and um, like synthetic light in the evenings. But, and, and again, I think some people that work with me think, well, I'm going to just say like, you know, turn, turn all the lights off. Obviously that's just, that's just not feasible. So, and obviously we know loads of people, loads of people watch television and we all have electric light on and, and lots and lots and lots of people sleep well. So it's not true to say that we need complete darkness for melatonin to start being produced. No, what we need is, and obviously, like I say, in a tribal community, light would be a very good indicator of this, but there are all the cues we can give our body. We need to have a run in time. We need to have some kind of lead in time. So it could be light and it, it light is a really important element. However, there's a realism about, you know, the, the society in which we live and what we have to do. So there can be other cues that we need in the evening to start to trigger that because like I say, if we work with our bodies and we work to support and reinforce that natural 24 hour rhythm, our bodies will work with us and it will just start the melatonin. It will, it will recognize its time as well as seeing the triggers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So then you need less of a trigger, I guess is what I'm saying. What I found from experience working with clients is like anything, you start off with more kind of a more regimented approach and then as you go you know it, it loosens up and um you know you you can sit and sit and obviously read in full light and then go to sleep that's fine in terms of the middle of the night and darkness what they talk about darkness for particularly is that one of the triggers to wake up is that your eyelids detect light and your eyelids detect light even very low lights and uh, amounts of light with your eyes shut. So the light can actually filter through your eyelids even when they're closed. So again, it's important to sleep in darkness because what you wouldn't want to inadvertently do is trigger your, your mind to be thinking it's starting to be morning with the light. So, so there, are those, there are those kind of things. But again, like anything, each individual has personal sensitivities to this kind of thing. And one of the things I do with clients is, is help them work through what are my particular sensitivities. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. So are there certain hours that are more beneficial? So say between the hours of like 11 and four, you should have no bright light or no light exposure to get the best sleep. So again, as I say, it's more individual. Different people will find that they have different triggers and tolerances. Um, so what you want to do is really just be thinking about what's important to you. So if you're not sleeping through those hours, then yes, um, if I was working with you, we'd probably explore various options about how that might be. But um, I'm reluctant to say this is a hard and fast rule because, because it's not. And mm -hmm what we want to do is support people because we're making we're making the same analogy right around diet and around exercise would you say to someone that they had to do yoga at you know 7 a.m in the morning no no of course not so there's a whole range of gambits of things that you can do to support your sleep mm -hmm. but there are recommendations around if you're struggling with sleep then yeah thinking about light exposure in the day and reducing light exposure in the evening at night is a sensible strategy um, well, speaking of yoga in the morning, just in regards to exercise, does exercising in the morning benefit sleep over exercising in the afternoon or evening? Yeah, so there has, there has been studies done around this as well, and not just linked to sleep. There's all sorts of studies about when is the best time of day to exercise, whether what, you know, depending on what the goal of that exercise mm -hmm. is. But what I, what I tend to say to people is, again, it requires to me a bit of common sense around some people love exercise in the evening because they say if i do a really intensive workout i feel tired and then i could drop off and i can totally see how that could work mm -hmm. however if you're having really energetic exercise that is getting you know cortisol flowing and adrenaline flowing then they're sleep inhibitors so that's perhaps not a good idea to do that last thing at night for some people it'd be much more therapeutic to do yoga or pilates or some kind of relaxing exercise late at night and save the intense exercise 
for the morning mm -hmm. and it, and again there you know there are some suggestions that what we're also doing here is reinforcing those more typical um primitive patterns of activity that we would have had so we would have been again if we're looking back in time we would have had a more active morning and then a more relaxing evening and that would follow a more natural pattern and so some people have suggested that then again that fit fits with the whole kind of you know daily routine supporting the melatonin production mm -hmm. but if i sound cautious it's because what I don't want to suggest to people is that they have to live like as if they're living in, you know, like prehistoric man times or that we, they can't do their favorite thing. So I work with a lot of clients who were like, well, I don't want to stop doing X, Y, and Z. And then we, we work around that because life is life. Right. And we all have our, have our things that we like to do that, that mean a lot to us. So it's not impossible. There's no set routine where you say, if you don't follow this, or if you break this rule, you can never sleep. So I'm reluctant to kind of um, give that impression that people have to follow a set formula. Mm -hmm. um, are there other things that melatonin does for our body as far as reparative or, or is it just induced sleep? No, there, there is other things. And um, I'm not an expert on, on melatonin, but I know that they're still studying melatonin. So there is definitely a belief that melatonin is not just a sleep hormone, that it does lots of other things, mm -hmm. um, not all of which are known. And I think this is one of the issues around taking melatonin because um, what I would say is there hasn't been an absolute conclusive study of melatonin and what it's responsible for and what it's not. So yeah, so I, I don't know all the details, but I definitely know that, yes, it does contribute to all the things apart from sleep. Well, you know, that's good you brought that up about taking melatonin because, yes, it is a natural supplement, but as I've studied it just a little bit, I read that, yes, it helps you fall asleep, but it may not help you stay asleep, which, again, impacts your overall well-being and overall getting the reparative sleep you need. Um, yeah. So I do remember reading about that. What about, you know, we talked a little bit about cortisol, the stress hormone, and it's supposed to be decreased at night. You know, you're supposed to not be stressed. You're supposed to be, you know, your rest and digest systems kicked in, you're relaxed. But when you're not sleeping, it's elevated throughout the night. And, um, it's supposed to be elevated in the morning, right? Because it's supposed yep. to be waking you up. Yep. So what are the effects of having elevated cortisol elevated all night while you're not, where you're supposed to be sleeping? Yeah. And, and this is, this is, again, this is really common. And, and I'm glad you asked about this because this is, this is the biggest kind of thing that I see with my clients. Cause most of the clients I work with, I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing people with, you know, a serious medical condition around sleep. I'm seeing like the everyday ordinary person who is just like you are talking about just your experience, right? Otherwise healthy, but not educated on sleep and just quite confused about why can't I sleep? I don't think there's anything wrong, but I can't sleep. And this is a really good example of a typical problem that I see. So people stuck in what I tend to call the sleep worry cycle or the mm -hmm. sleep anxiety cycle. So you're absolutely right. You don't sleep for one night or you don't sleep for a while. And then what happens is you're running on more cortisol. It makes you more anxious because you're not sleeping. You're feeling tired. For some people, then they start worrying about the fact that they're not sleeping. And then that gives them more anxiety. And then in the night, you're right. Now I'm thinking about the fact that I'm not sleeping and I have to get up for work tomorrow and I have an important meeting and I'm going to, like to your point, I'm going to look awful. I'm going to feel awful. Now I'm worrying again. Now my cortisol level is rising again and now I can't sleep. And there's massive, massive studies around cortisol. Again, not just linked to sleep, but the effects of, you know, repeated stimulation of the the, the fight or flight mechanism, the stress response, we're mm -hmm. not supposed to have that firing all the time. Mm -hmm. But generally in life, um, particularly in our modern lives, we are getting that stress response far too much. So that's not me talking. That is, you know, I'm like you, a wider, I've read more widely than sleep. That's a more wider problem mm -hmm. that we are experiencing the stress response quite a lot. 
mm-hmm. that then you're right that basically inhibits sleep which which feeds this cycle on and on and on so it's a really common problem that i see you're so right about being anxious about sleep because now that i've really learned about how important sleep is for my body and how i can live longer and healthier <laughs> I'm really worried when I'm not getting sleep and it's like, Oh no, I need to get sleep. But yet I'm like up all night, you know? So it does impact that. And as far as people with health problems, and I was just taking care of a patient yesterday, he works the night shift and he's not sleeping. And not only is he not sleeping, now he's eating more. And not only is he eating more, he's eating bad food and he's drinking more alcohol. So it's this cascade of things that happen just from not sleeping in those hours. And I think you and I were talking about that a little bit um, earlier, you know, just kind of talking about doing this podcast, how, you know, not sleeping impacts those hunger hormones and, you know, the great Gerlin and leptin. And um, so I think we should touch on that because it is so important as far as people trying to lose weight and be healthy. Um, But one thing back on the cortisol, just from knowing with my background is cortisol being elevated all the time, like we're talking about, raises blood pressure, raises blood sugars. So when you're trying to manage health problems like blood pressure and heart disease and weight and obesity, you can see how not sleeping, you know, is you're really contributing to all those problems, uh, like you were saying. So let's talk a little bit. You you were telling me the other day, people will think twice about maybe feeling a little, you know, maybe hitting McDonald's, you know, there were like, you know, like, I know I shouldn't be eating this burger. Um, but people don't really make that connection with sleep. They don't have that in association with sleep. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. This is such a good point and, and the one I deal most often in the first place and definitely in my own journey, this is what I found. So when I struggle with sleep and I had the children, and I was just saying like, I thought that once the children slept better, I would sleep better and I didn't. So the first thing I did was go and talk to other people about this point. So I talked to my family, I talked to my friends, I talked to all the mums and the response that I got was, ah, what do you expect? You chose to work full time. You chose to have three kids. This is like a fun, like what you expected sleep as well. What? Like what? Yeah. Like it's comedy. Like it was funny. And, right. and my mother-in-law was saying to me, you know, she's quite old school and she's like saying, oh, well, you know, you are working, you chosen to work. Maybe you should give up your job. You can't expect it was this. You can't expect. You have to expect to be tired. You have to tolerate it. You have to put up with it. We have a lot of society talking, you know, this general feeling of society that we've grown up with. Mm -hmm. I'm an 80s girl. It was around, you know, cutting sleep. We had Margaret Thatcher. We had Ronald Reagan. They were always talking about we don't sleep. It's it's the power kind of thing. It's macho. It's sucking it up. It's getting it on. And it's really instilled itself into our, certainly my generation. And so we're tolerating it. And so you're right. So instead of feeling guilty about not sleeping, it's almost the opposite. Not sleeping is a badge of honor that I'm so busy. I'm so important. I'm so hardcore. I'm getting on with it. Right. And, 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 that, and that's it. That's to me, that's really one of the big contributors of why sleep is becoming such a problem because we've all grown up with mm-hmm. that view that we should, as I say, certainly my generation, um, as opposed to my parents' generation, it was about just keeping on going and look how much you can keep on going. So you're right. So when I, when I'm busy and I go to McDonald's, I'm properly guilty about it. I'm like, Oh, I know this is like, Oh, it's not that bad, but I don't know. You know, you're still having the wrangle on you. I know I should really have some home cooked food right now, but I'm so busy and I'm rushing to a meeting. I'll just get a drive through. And when you're giving it to your kids, you're like, I shouldn't be doing this. (laughs) Give it to my kids and like seeing the shame. And I'm like, like being on the shame of like the McDonald's worker, like you just give your kids like three happy meals and like you pass them to the back of the car. Yeah, like, okay, yeah. don't hate on Let's me. just pretend this so, is um, Yeah, so exactly. We'll give them but a salad see- later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. find, like, can we swap out? I don't know if it happens in the States. In the UK, you can swap out the fries for an, a bag of apple slices. <laughs> but do you do it? <laughs> they is want it the a- fries. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. I want the prize at the bottom of the bag. Please let there be one more. <laughs> exactly. So that's the, that's the big difference, you know. And again, when I talk to people about that, they're like, oh, yeah. And you talk to people, what did you do last night? Did you go to, did you stop what you were doing and turn off your tech and have a relax and start your evening routine? Or did you answer 10 more emails? Mm -hmm. Or did you order something off of Amazon that you needed that you forgot mm -hmm. to order? Or did you run around putting the dustbin out for the bin men? Or whatever it was that you did, you know, we yeah. just keep ratcheting it up. There's no guilt there. Yeah. We actually yeah. sometimes feel the opposite. We should keep going. It, it's better for us to keep going. Yeah. Well, you know, we are also talking about the hormones and I think this is so important for people to realize. And I just finished this book called The Obesity Code and he goes into really what happens when we sleep in relation to our hormones. And I didn't really realize this and you brought this up to me, you know, yeah, not only are you hungrier, you're eating more. Um, also, you're, you're craving bad food yeah. and really it's all hormonal doing that to us. Like, yeah, we're craving the starchy, sugary foods and yeah. it's all based on the fact we didn't sleep. And, yeah. um, and I, and then we were talking about leptin, another hormone, and this is the hormone that helps us realize we're full. So you have one hormone going up saying, I'm hungry. You have one hormone going down that's supposed to be telling you you're full. So that's not working. So yeah. now you're hungrier and you don't get full as faster and you're yeah. eating bad food. So it all compounds. Yeah. And, and, and that's the one thing that you brought up how like, yeah, you're like, you're craving bad food and you're, so it, it all yeah. plays into the next day, how, you know, you're hungrier, yeah, so you're eating worse and you're, you're exhausted. I, I, so I looked this up because like, after we talked about it earlier and I, 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 I reminded myself like I was like I want to go remind myself because I knew there were some like actual quantifiable stats they put around this and I looked yeah. it up and it's so interesting so you're right so they so exactly that the, the, the hormone responsible for hunger goes up and then at the same time the hormone responsible for telling us we've eaten enough when we finish goes down and they they have tried to study and actually equate this in numbers and what they think that it equates to i don't don't ask me how they did this was 300 extra calories per day just the effect of that alone and then what they also showed us on top of that so those two things three things was you actually then start snacking so this is on top of the bigger meal you now have. So you now want to eat more often and then you want to eat more bigger meals. Right. Exactly what you were talking about. You start then snacking more and they reckon that could be another 300 calories as well on wow. top of it. We're talking <laughs> every day. Yeah. And then you're right. And then they studied it separately to show, yeah, when you go for the snacks, it's not just the snacks like, oh, okay, yeah, I want a banana or a piece of, a piece of fruit. No, you're right. You want sugar. Yeah. You yeah. want starchy foods. You want um, like um, salty foods as well. So yeah, all yeah. the sort, sort of like bad snacky foods. And yeah, interestingly, like even more than fat, they showed this craving. <laughs> so that was another thing. They also showed then that um, we, what happens is, so we're talking about that. You're right. It's all hormonal driven. It's all kind of subconscious hormonal driven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we like to think, and this is another massive crucial thing about sleep that I really want people to understand, and we can talk a bit more about this, is what they've shown when you don't sleep is that your prefrontal cortex, all of the kind of really advanced, highly evolved, you know, mm -hmm. cognizant processing going on becomes kind of, kind of derailed slightly from your subconscious and from your more emotional parts of your brain. So guess what that means is basically your willpower is now not functioning. So <laughs> even if you know you're craving more and you're, you, even if you could rationally logic, oh, hey, I didn't sleep last night. And so now I'm feeling tired. And so now I'm reaching for these, you know, salty snacks. Yeah. You're actually not as much um, kind of linked and coordinated to those parts of the brain. So it's actually harder for you to use willpower to resist. And that's a really crucial thing because when we, when we have wrangles and debates amongst, you know, the, the, the community that is struggling to lose weight and the community that is saying to that, that, to that other community, you know, you need to have more willpower. 
you you yep. need to just you know just sort yourself out just eat less right. you know just right. eat better foods right right this is really important because what you're saying is you you can't you you almost can't control it so you you're craving it more and then you don't even have your cognitive processes functioning well yeah. to fully get a grip and use your willpower so you're kind of doubly failing and then yeah what they've also showed is like then obviously you get into the whole beating yourself up about the fact that, you know, oh, you know, you get to the end of the day and you're like, I have no willpower. That's rubbish. I may as well give up. And again, lack of sleep, we've stopped being able to be fully rational at that point because we haven't sleep. So our, our, our ability to be rational. And then the final thing, just to like totally add ice into this cake is they also discovered that even if you did do really well and you got yourself out there and you exercise and you're going to lose weight, the body stores fat that when you're tired, the body holds on to fat. So what they also discovered was that you're going to burn muscle mass before mm-hmm. fat when you're tired as well. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's really bad news. It's really, and, and I, I, I don't know whether if they, like you saying, whether they fully have mapped out the link between a society that we know sleep problems are increasing and a society where we know obesity is increasing as well. I mean, you know, there may or may not be a link there, but it seems good coincidence to me. You are so right about the willpower because just going through school, you know, I would be up studying and then I would have to get up the next morning and a few hours sleep. And it was like going to work all day for 12 hours. Yeah. So in that morning, I want a Dr. Pepper. You know what? It's fine. It's fine. You know, it's not going to hurt anything. I have to get through this day. And then, yep. yeah. Then later, I want to head for the Starbucks. You know, I've already blown it this morning with the Dr. <laughs> Pepper. I mean, why not at the Starbucks? Exactly. You know, I mean, and this was like ongoing for me. So I totally believe that. And yeah, and it's just like people didn't realize, don't realize, just like I didn't realize, like how this like, thing was compounding because I wasn't prioritizing the one thing, sleep, that could help me overcome those things. So you are so right about that. And I think that is so crucial for people to realize. And also on the mental health aspect we had talked about, um, there is relational ties to lack of sleep and depression. And it's an area in the brain that actually correlates, right? With like not sleeping and depression. Yeah, so they've, again, this has been quite well studied as well. And what they've shown is it goes back to what I was talking about, or, or one theory that they have is what I talked about before, where there's a slight decoupling, I guess, is the best way to describe it, between our cognitive part of our brain and our, and our more emotional subconscious parts mm-hmm. of the brain that are dealing with emotion. And so we're just not able to keep it under control, I guess, and we're more emotionally driven. So obviously, we are really sophisticated beings, but you know, our machinery, if you like, of our brain is very sensitive. Mm -hmm. So we have all this like immense capability to be highly intelligent, to be highly creative, to be highly driven. Um, But really only when we're able to keep our emotional drives in check Mm -hmm. or to to kind of manage our emotional drives, I guess, I'm not oversimplifying, but you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, And what they've shown is sleep decouples this, this possibility. So we're just not, kind of holding in a check and balance our emotions in the same way as we would be when we have slept and are fully functioning. And interestingly, what they've shown is that that doesn't actually kind of just dull everything. What that, what they've shown is it actually sends people off, but they studied it in the lab. It actually sent people off into mood swings, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So people were going from like elated to then angry, to then sad, to then kind of leveling off. And it's these kind of mood swings that they've, they've talked about leads to, they've made these links to these problems. So when we go off into kind of sadness or anger, we maybe go too far. And so we, we're kind of bordering, you know, we're kind of pushing on that really dark place and that's what they show with sleep. And then obviously, if that happens too much, then people can tend towards depression. And then what I, what I also read was really interesting is even you might think, well, okay, well, so maybe if I'm sort of in a bad mood, but then I go back into a good mood, 
But then they show that like when we go into a kind of good mood, we become hypersensitive to that. And so then we become like thrill seeking, risk taking. And that's when some people, that's the link that they think that may be where the link becomes in between sleep and addiction because they have made that link also as well. And so yeah. it's that it's that it's that pleasure seeking trigger that we're getting. And again, these are because yeah we've started to be more controlled by our more primitive, more basic emotional urges and our um, prefrontal cortex is not, is not in control. And it, it, it's, it's really sad because like you're saying in that moment, you just don't know that you, that that's the real sadness for me. You don't actually recognize that in yourself Mm -hmm. because your because your cognitive brain is not functioning because that is the part yeah. of the brain that would recognize it for you and it's yeah. not working so well. So that's the real, that's the real tragedy for me. Yeah. And also everything seems to be worse at nighttime and it, it, it's gotta be because of everything we're talking about, you know, and you know, you're more fearful, you're more anxious when you're going through a lot. And not only that, now you've lost your ability to cope, you know, yeah. it's, it's everything is compounded. And, yeah. um, I know just going through that with my own self and anxiety and my daughter, you know, we had some really long, hard nights because the anxiety was so high and the depression was so high. And I remember just thinking, you know, and telling her in the morning, everything will seem so much better, you know, Yeah. but yeah it's just, it's all of these hormones and all of these physiological real things that are happening. It is real. And I feel, and I feel like it's so important for people to realize that, that it's all of these things compounding that is making it so hard to lose weight, be emotionally stable, be productive at work, um, get these tasks done that you want to get done. Whereas, you know, really, that next day, that next good day really starts the night before. Yeah. It really starts the night before. And I, I think that was really hard for me to realize. Um, so I'm still working on that area. But one thing that you brought up to me that I want to talk about a little bit and what you've had some podcasts about is how getting sleep affects your business and your productivity at work and how it can impair that yeah so this is an area i'm super interested in and particularly because and it goes back to my thing about my experience which was when i got sleep and and you like i said in the context of i was really struggling if i'm really brutally honest with myself looking back i was really struggling so I had on paper this great life. I had a great job. I still, ha- still have a great job. The three kids were healthy, you know, mm-hmm. a gorgeous home and all the rest of it. But like you were saying, the underlying that, this feeling of kind of mood swings and anxiety and self-doubt and not being out, feeling like I was on an endless treadmill and really kind of detached from my life almost because I was living in this kind of tiredness. And I didn't even have, it wasn't like I was not sleeping every night. It was only maybe two or three nights a week. So you're saying like exactly like you're saying, I'm not really fully aware of what I'm actually inflicting upon myself at this point. Mm -hmm. And I had my mother-in-law, as I said, saying, why don't you give up work? You're taking on too much. And, and and that really made me sad because I hadn't really wanted to make a choice, right. About doing this one thing or this one thing, or this one Mm -hmm. thing. I, I wanted all these things. And people were telling me, well, you shouldn't want all these things. You know, you want too much. Um, But what I found was, and this is why I'm so interested in the link between sleep and business, is that when I got sleep consistently, consistent great sleep every night, what I found was I did my job, I looked after the children, I was happier, I got all the stuff done around the house, and what I actually did was then train to be a sleep coach and set up my sleep business on the side. So I actually did more. And so when you look into that, the stats are really clear. If you sleep well, you have up to 30% more energy. So you're like speedy. You have 30% more energy. You're getting stuff done faster. You have 40% better decision-making powers. You have 40% better problem-solving powers. You have, and this is such a big stat for me, you have up to 60% less negative response to when things don't go well. You get 60% reduction in that negative emotional response 
when things don't go well. Wow. And do you know, I think if we're all honest, well, if I'm on, maybe I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I want to speak for myself. I, there was a lot of times that I told myself I was dead busy and I was dead productive. And looking back on it now, I was not. I was, I was dead busy procrastinating and I was dead <laughs> yeah. busy worrying right. and I was dead busy talking myself in and out and in and out and in and out of decisions. You know, one day I'd be like, yeah, I'm doing that. And then the next day, no, I don't want to do that. Next day. So all of this flip flopping, which I now know is a, like we've talked about is a really good characteristic of people who are not getting sleep, flip flopping, different emotions. All of that was actually depleting the time and energy and skill that I had. And there's loads more stats, creativity, you know, it just, it just goes, it just goes on. Mm -hmm. So it's massively impactful on business. It is. And they've done these studies and that's why there's a big lean into corporate, large corporates now looking at sleep kind of programs for their mm -hmm. staff because they realize mm -hmm. the lack of productivity that you can mm -hmm. get with people not sleep. Mm -hmm. And I, there's so many more things about, you know, it's always about the morning routine, the morning routine. And I believe that is really one of the biggest things that's helped me in my life is just making that small change of getting up a little earlier, getting things done that I want to get done. But really it's about the night routine, incorporating that night routine at ritual, like you were saying to you know, get yourself to sleep so that you can get up earlier the next morning and have that day start the day you want to have yeah. really, like I said, starts the night before. And what you're talking about, you know, the rituals, the routine, working yourself into sleep. It, I mean, you can see now how that just plays out into your whole life, your decision-making skills, you know, all of those things that really impact your work your relationships. I mean, yeah. the moodiness. I mean, there was times where people, my family were like, who are you today? You know, and it's true. And it's just because it was, it wasn't just like one night of not getting sleep. It was over and over and yeah. over again. And I think that there's so many people that live like that and it's just setting them up for health problems and relationship problems. And it's just, it's so, sad to me. Um, I want to talk with you a little bit about um, what about, you know, how much is there evidence that shows how much sleep we really need to have? Is there a consensus? Because I've heard, you know, sleep right for, you know, get enough sleep for your sleep type. Is there really evidence that shows a certain amount of sleep is necessary? Yeah, I mean, I've obviously read a lot about this and obviously there's variation, but there is a consensus or in the main, there's a consensus that somewhere between seven to nine hours sleep is the optimum amount of sleep. Mm -hmm. And that varies from person to person, but it also varies from day to day. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I found really nice about being on lockdown, because you know, we're still on lockdown here in the UK for the most part is that, um, cause I'm not going into the office. I'm not setting an alarm to get on the train. So, so my, my sleep, so going to bed is fairly static, but when exactly I wake up, I've actually noticed now because I've had this really long period where there's no alarm clock that it really does vary from night to night. And some nights it can vary quite a lot in that space, probably like variation of up to an hour, um, I find. And so that's really, really interesting because like we talked about before, the crucial point is the tasks that you rack up in the day have to be finished and your brain will finish them and then wake you up when you're finished like it, it's just really neat like that it's just yeah. how it works it's like if i need seven hours to get it all done i'll get it all done in seven hours and i'll wake you up and yeah. if i need extra because you know yesterday you went on a training course and you took in a whole lot of information and i'm still filtering that it's taking me ages or, yeah. you know, we, like you say, we had, we had an argument yesterday and it was a really emotional day or so that's going to take me a little bit more time to process. So that's how it works. And that's why there's, that's why there's a variation from person to person and from, from day to day. But all the stats that I've talked about, um, they, they tend to be looking at seven hours of sleep or less. So it depends obviously what that scientist was doing in that study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but some of the hard hitting stats that we get it's when we get seven hours less and it and it's 
and it's interesting because when you read sleep studies they talk about chronic sleep deprivation mm -hmm. they can have a study where they they give people six hours sleep in a laboratory and call that chronic sleep deprivation mm -hmm. and we're not calling that chronic sleep deprivation right. there are a lot of people out there just calling that their normal night's sleep they're saying right. that's that's their night's sleep because maybe they sleep all of those six hours so they're like okay yeah i got a full night's sleep mm -hmm. no according to some studies you're in chronic sleep deprivation because you're there's no way you can have finished the tasks in that time but you know for, for the mm -hmm. for the average person obviously there's exceptions you know to every to every mm -hmm. rule but that's the consensus is there a certain amount of so you know what is the average sleep cycle is there is it like i think i was reading maybe 90 minutes is that right yeah, that's right. So you so you do go in sleep cycles of, of 90 minutes. That's that's true. And there are sleep cycles, but each sleep cycle in the night is not equal. Okay. So you do more of your deep sleep in the start of the night, and then you're doing more of your dream sleep or REM sleep later in the night. And okay. so what's interesting is that they're saying is some of the stuff that we've been talking about, like memory consolidation and kind of so dealing with your emotions and things like that. And then creativity that you get through dreaming, dreaming, they really think is a lot about processing information and creativity to some extent. What we tend to do is that's the part of sleep. We tend to lop off when the alarm goes <laughs> off. So for a lot of people that, that because the, the way there's the, you know, the sleep cycle through the night is designed, they're tending to lop off, um, the same bit of sleep every night although although having said that there's all the studies that show that if you push out your sleep really late and say you don't go to sleep till like 2 a.m mm -hmm. that then your body kind of almost knows that you're starting sleep halfway through the night so there's all the studies that show that it's really interesting that whether we only do that typical sleep pattern if we're actually sleeping in the portion of the night that we're supposed to sleep i hope i hope that makes <laughs> i hope that makes sense yeah so it's like your body already cuts off that good part of initial sleep, that deep sleep. Um, yeah, some, yeah, some that's interesting. And, yeah. and, I, and I read, or I was listening, and because um, I've been listening to a lot about sleep to prepare for this, and um, I read that human growth hormone, our youth hormone, actually is released earlier into our, in our sleep cycle. So like within an hour, to the first three hours is when it's the highest. And I found that was interesting. So you're saying if you're missing that initial sleep, you're missing that boost of human growth hormone. Yeah. So, and again, there are different studies on this, but there are, I mean, sleep is every time I talk about sleep that there we're so on the tip of the iceberg for the science, yeah. you know, we really don't know that much about it really, but, yeah. but I heard there that are some, <laughs> there are some studies that have found that, you would logically think that if the process of sleep was the same, that no matter when you go to bed and what time of night you go to bed, you start off and then you run through that sleep cycle. And then when you wake up early, you're always chopping off only the bit at the end. However, some sort of shown that they don't, some sort of found they don't think that's necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And the theory that they put forward is perhaps if you go to bed late, it's like in the early hours of the morning, perhaps your body understands that you've already lost that ability to sleep at that particular point of the night mm. and then so yeah it kickstarts you later but again you know with all these studies because for every study you'll probably find a contradictory study so yeah. you know that's the way it is but we're still really early doors in the science but right. um there are there what i'm giving you is is the information that is is coming out as a repeat occurrence in mm -hmm. the in the science and, and is, is becoming mm -hmm. a consensus which is really what you want to look at. You want to look at the research all kind of lining up saying similar things. So that's actually great that you're giving me that. So can we catch up sleep? So the answer to this unfortunately is not really. Um, like I was talking about before, you know, when we do all the tasks in the day, we have to have sleep at night to process those tasks that we've done. And we have to finish the completion of processing those tasks really at the time that we did the tasks, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So if we don't finish them, it just, it just often doesn't get done. And then we accrue a sleep debt. So you can accrue a sleep debt and you'll hear people talking about a sleep debt. 
and so they've looked at this and a lot of people do do misunderstand this so they think that okay i get up very early every morning and i have the alarm go off and so i miss sleep in the so i miss sleep in the week but mm-hmm. that's okay because i sleep up on the weekend and then i'll catch up so mm-hmm. they did a really interesting study where they showed that they tried to recreate this to see if it actually was true and what they showed is when they deprived people of sleep during the week and then they gave them three nights of full sleep so that's more than we would have on a weekend really because we would probably have like Friday night, maybe Saturday night, but probably on Sunday night, then their alarm is going off in the morning again, Monday mm-hmm. morning. And they still didn't catch up. So even and three full nights of sleep wasn't enough to compensate for this week of lack of sleep. Mm. So that's how, that's how kind of serious it is. That's how crucial it is to get that sleep every night. So the analogy I gave before about the party you can't just keep having parties every day mm-hmm. and not cleaning up at the end of the day at the weekend, you know, you wouldn't just be able to have a couple of extra hours and clean up the house. It would still be like a complete mess. So, so it's the same. So no, not, unfortunately not. And this is the, this is the big difference that people will find. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you, th- what do you recommend with your clients on sleep aids? So again, it's really interesting. What I try to do is, is, promote to my clients um, to start with, let's look at lifestyle, let's look at natural stuff, let's look at giving you a sleep education so that you fundamentally understand what's going on. And then Mm -hmm. so you can try and identify as far as we can, the root cause of your sleep issue. And what I would say to people is there is a place for everything and sleep aids, there is a place for, and they were designed for specific things. Mm -hmm. But I would really urge people to, understand about their own sleep problem and try and identify the root cause of that problem and then try and educate themselves about the risks and side effects associated with sleep aids because then they can make an informed choice and i see the big problem and this could be whether this is with medication or over-the-counter remedies or just simply sleep products that people are selling you know like I don't know, like a a candle for sleep or, you know, a guided meditation for sleep and all those things. Mm -hmm. They're all great and they all have their place. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a fundamental basic education around sleep, just around the kind of things we've been talking about, Mm -hmm. you know, you've read loads, it probably didn't take you that long to read loads about sleep. Start out with this basic education of sleep and then you'll really understand and be able to make informed choices about mm-hmm. about what you want to try or what you don't want to try. Mm-hmm. And obviously you'll take guidance from your from your doctor as well. Um well let's get into what hinders sleep. What I mean, we've heard of caffeine and you and I kind of talked a lot about this a little bit. What what is it about caffeine that hinders our sleep? I mean, I know it's a stimulant. But is it that we're drinking too much of it too late? Or what is truly going on with caffeine? Yeah, so this is, again, this is really interesting because, again, this is a part of, um, of the kind of information that people lack because they don't have this basic education. So we, we talked earlier about all these mechanisms that are prepping our body for sleep. So we talked about light exposure and all that kind of good stuff, all that kind of thing that people generally call sleep hygiene and all those things that we should be doing to prepare our body for sleep, Mm -hmm. give it the correct signals and allow that melatonin to come in. And so we Mm -hmm. feel nice and sleepy and then all being well, if we feel nice and sleepy, then, you know, hopefully sleep will come in. But then there's another series of mechanisms at work. And again, this is what a lot of people don't understand. There's a whole series of counter mechanisms which can then, even if the melatonin is nice and high and we all feel sleepy, can inhibit the melatonin, can inhibit the sleepiness. Mm. And this is really logical and sensible if you think about it in terms of evolution, because we wouldn't want to just fall asleep, right? Like randomly. So it would be no good if, if our, because sleep is an automatic process. It's not like eating where we physically choose when to eat and then we could physically right. choose to put the food down if something interrupts us. Sleep is an automatic process. So we, we'll be very dangerous for us to just build up this melatonin. And then when the melatonin hits some kind of like, you know, a magic level, we just fall asleep. That would be really dangerous. So obviously our bodies have evolved these mechanisms where we could inhibit that mechanism 
if we needed to. So if there's a saber tooth tiger around, if we're right in the middle of hunting and then we get interrupted, you know, I'm, I'm talking about these, obviously these original kind of basic right. kind of um, evolution for sleep. And so the, these kind of things come into play. So we do have natural things like cortisol, which will be in our body, which will be inhibiting the melatonin will be inhibiting the sleep and mm. they were put there for those defense well, they were put there we evolved them for the for those defense purposes mm-hmm. caffeine was developed as um an artificial recreation of that so it was the deliberate recreation of one of those chemical substances that can um block the uptake of melatonin so basically inhibit or block or mask or whatever kind of term is easiest um to help you understand it, just covering it up the crucial thing is um when you start to get into a sleep issue it doesn't stop you feeling tired and it doesn't take away that need for sleep it doesn't mm. like we talked about there's a whole bunch of like washing up piling up doesn't get rid of the washing up doesn't do anything to negate the need for sleep it just diverts our attention and triggers that mechanism that overrides sleep Mm. and you're right so again we're back to that kind of individual tolerance so as you would know i'm sure you know people my husband being one of them could happily drink a cup of coffee at 10 p.m in the evening still go right to sleep so (laughs) you know it's about individual tolerance to these things um but what most people don't realize is caffeine stays in our system for ages so you mm. can have a drink in the afternoon and it's still washing for your system. Mm. So really to get sleep, you should, if you want to get to bed by like 10, you should cut off your caffeine by what, like one or two. I mean, this stays in your system, the, the half-life of caffeine, meaning it takes that long to just get half of it out of your system. Right. Right. So the half-life of caffeine they think is anywhere between five and six hours just to get half that cup of coffee out. Um, And so when you think about that, yes, exactly. If you have a cup of coffee at um, two o'clock, then you'll still have half a cup in your system at eight o'clock. But if you didn't just have that one coffee at two o'clock, if that coffee at two o'clock was actually preceded by a coffee at 11 o'clock and a coffee at nine o'clock, then it's soon ratcheting up. So this is when I talk to clients a lot about this most of the reason people can't sleep really starts in the daytime. A lot of people Mm. are very focused and and this is where we're back to kind of sleep aids and sleep products, Kim, is a lot of people are focused on what can I do immediately before bed? What can I've got? I've got half an hour. I'm very busy. I've got half an hour. Give me half an hour and I'll do something. You know, should I take something out of a bottle? Should I do a guided meditation? Should I do this? And what I really want people to understand is all these things in the day, how you handle, how you're handling your stress, how much coffee are you drinking, how are you really setting up your routine, all the things that you talked about, they're all, they're all setting you up for, for sleep in the evening or not. So yes, it, it depends on how many cups of coffee you have, how early you had them, how many cups you had yesterday. I mean, if it takes a whole 24 hours to get rid of a cup. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Um, Well, also, as far as hindering sleep, we hear a lot about technology. And I think this is probably the even bigger than cutting off caffeine. I think it is so hard in our society to put the technology away. And it's just constant stimulation. And I know for me, it, it is true. It's really hard. So even with the teens and the kids, it's like really taking that technology maybe even out of the bedroom can help, but it's so really hard to do. Do you find that your clients really battle with technology interfering with their sleep? Yeah, they do. Most of the clients I work with are highly intelligent, really, you know, high up professionals often that they're, they're they're really, they're really busy. They, they've got a lot to do and they really feel the pressure and, they're answering work emails or because they've been working all day, they're doing all the stuff at night. 
that's part of it. So, the, so, the, so part of it is the technology because we want to be busy and busy these days normally involves some kind of technology like I talked about. I mean, I'm doing the, the same, you know, you like remember last minute that you were supposed to order someone a birthday present. So you're on Amazon 10 a.m., like 10 p.m. Like, I'm like, right, okay, what should I get? Them? So, the, the, so there's that and there's looking at that. Um, but there's also, and you're right about this, about like technology coming out of the bedroom, we also have that kind of association with me time and we want me time and me time again um these days tends to involve netflix or you know some kind of technology and and that so yeah so look, i don't have a tv in the bedroom i used to years ago i certainly don't now i think it's the best thing ever it's like that is there's the line for me well it's funny you mentioned that because apparently there was a study done and this is like about like relationships and connectivity and just as far as relationships go, having a TV in your bedroom cuts down on your sex life by like half. And that's huge. And you can see how that impacts your relationship. Yeah. You know? So just by, I don't have a TV in my room either, but just by, making your bedroom more of a sacred area for like sleep and sex. I exactly. mean, think about how that can improve not only your health, but your relationship. Yep. Um, or as far as technology, I heard something else because we're going to get into this real quick um, about ways to enhance sleep and then ways to um, not only take away the technology, but using that time by maybe giving a technology curfew. And I'm going to do this with my kids because I've really been studying this and it's like, yeah, let's turn this off and really start connecting more with one another. Maybe have like real life conversations. Like <laughs> let's spend time together. Like my kids will literally be texting me from the basement or from their bedroom, you know? Um, so maybe like, have a curfew, set that curfew where, no, you're not on your phone anymore. Let's have a conversation or let you and your partner get to know each other again, spend time together, really connect, which improves your relationships and your health. I mean, is that one thing that you tell your clients to do? Maybe like, do you need to stop with technology maybe 30 minutes before bed or however long? Does that yeah. help? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a really key point. It's a really key point. I notice it in myself a lot. So if I am late and I and I do like say I'm still on the computer, I really notice the difference in the time taken to get to sleep. So you're right, and it's definitely something I advise clients to do for several reasons. One, because the blue light. So we talked earlier about light exposure. The mm -hmm. blue light um, is is stronger on on a on a screen than it is in a um, synthetic like bedside light for example mm -hmm. so again they've studied this and they've showed that somebody looking at a kindle still sleeps worse than somebody looking at a book a paper book mm -hmm. with a light a bedside light so even these kind of like slight differences um so the, the blue light is one thing but back to what you were talking about about the worry and the anxiety and and the switching off it's very very difficult because we're normally looking at something either work related or we're looking at something which is like i say reminding us of what stuff we have to do that's not for work or we're watching some like you know we're watching blooming i don't know like insert any name of any like you know like tiger king or whatever whatever the latest kind <laughs> yeah, of like you know seen that yet. yeah and like netflix thing yeah. is i don't know we watch a whole bunch of them but you know we're watching the latest thing like um well breaking bad or something my husband watches breaking bad i can't watch it but you know breaking bad and you're like oh my gosh like it's all ah, like high drama and stuff yeah. like that so again like we're probably stimulating our like cortisol again yeah. so there's several different reasons why tech is not a great thing to do last thing at night or we're watching the news crikey i always advise my clients, please don't watch the news last thing at night you know you 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 really have to have and like particularly that we talked about because we're not getting the light kind of messages that we would be getting if we lived outdoors we have to really give our body clear signals that we've mm -hmm. moved out of 
full on day phase and into night phase. And that for me is the key for tech. It's just carrying on the day so there is no end. We're not robots. We can't just turn off. We have to allow time for the melatonin to build. It doesn't build in 10 minutes. Um, we have to have that running time. That's how we were designed. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, and I was telling clients, imagine, you know, imagine they're living outside in a tribal community, the sun would go down. And it's not just the fact that the sun would go down. You physically can't do a lot because you're sat in the dark, with no electric light. Right. So as a whole community, as a whole tribe, this is exactly what you were talking about. You would have just slowed down and you would have just, you're right, just, gathered around the fire or around your homestead and started to have conversations and interactions you wouldn't have carried on doing whatever you were doing whether you were farming or you were hunting or you know maybe you were like building something at that point you wouldn't carry on those things because it would be dark so you'd be physically not able to do it so that's the connection that we need to make that kind of remembering of an evening routine um so Basically, ways to enhance sleep then are to, you know, darken the lights, turn them off, um, stop with technology, and um, really become, get, get a ritual together that you do each night that prepares your body for sleep. Is there anything else? Yeah. I mean, like I talked about on the sleep hygiene front, there's lots and lots on sleep hygiene, and it's really individual. And I do work with people to find out what it is particularly, mm -hmm. because like I say, what we don't want to say to people is go and live like a hermit. We right. want to find out what particular triggers people have. So mm -hmm. like, like we talked about, some people can have coffee late at night. That doesn't bother them. Some people right. could watch TV, horror films. I have good friends who watch horror films and can still go to sleep after. <laughs> I would be up for hours if I watch horror films last thing at night. So it's not a one size fits all, but so you're right. You have to develop something for you, which is a routine, but there are some general principles around light and around relaxation and around switching off and around closing down the day that people really want to understand. And then, like I say, there's a whole another half of it, which is once you've triggered the melatonin, you want to do things that are not going to then trigger these things which cut over the top and then inhibit mm -hmm. sleep. So even if you get yourself ready for bed and people again this is why people come to me and they say I've tried everything I get this a lot I've tried everything I tried having a bath and I tried doing the meditation and I tried so they they kind of did all the great things for sleep hygiene mm -hmm. but then they're still triggering the mechanisms which are inhibiting sleep over the top so and this is kind of where we get into how it's possible to feel tired exhausted even and yet still can't sleep because you've inadvertently triggered those other mechanisms so you're right but there's two things I would say. I had a client not so long ago who came to me and said, you know what? I realized that I'm not a good example for my kids. So it's interesting you talk about kids and the curfew for kids. She said, I give my child a technology curfew and then I don't follow it myself. Mm. So I say to my child, you have to turn your, your electronic stuff off by this time, but I'm allowed to go as long as I want. Mm. But then I have a sleep problem. Right. So, right. you know, this is, to your point, this is the message that we're giving to the kids and this is mm -hmm. the, the stand. And, you know, certainly it's like, it's, it's, it's one rule for kids and then one rule for adults. And mm -hmm. as most of us parents, we're really good at trying to watch our children sleep. Mm -hmm. And then we don't do the same things. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not that much different. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Um, yeah. I have not been a very good role model in the sleep department, but I'm, I'm getting better at it. And one thing, one thing I was thinking about that I'm starting to do when you're taking away technology, replace it with something meaningful, like maybe, like I said, journaling, or being, or like connecting with your family, your significant other, your kids, journaling was what I was just trying to think about. And then like you said, reading a book, just reading can make you tired. I think that takes away from what you were saying about the blue light. And also I think it can add to what I say a lot is like living more intentional, living more meaningful, living more grateful. And I think at the end of the night, instead of being stimulated or stressed out with what is going on in the news, which is huge lately, you know, 
focusing on like what you're grateful for yeah. and journaling and just relaxing. And I think that just kind of grounds you and um, helps you go to sleep. I think, I think that's been helpful. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm really glad you brought that up. It's so it's again, it's another great example of it's not rocket science. It's really not rocket science. Like I help people find, you know, where they need to come at in lifestyle. A lot of it is lifestyle. And like you say, making really good choices and living more in the moment and not worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow hasn't even arrived yet. Right. And, that is so true. You know, your, your brain will just carry on. Your brain is so nice. And the doctor said this to me, this is what really hit home when I, when I first kind of had my sleep issues was, Doctor was like, your brain is really nice. It will carry on processing and basically until it falls over for you. That <laughs> yeah. doesn't mean you should do it. <laughs> right. We, I think yeah, we have to take care of our brain. Um, so is there anything that you want to tell people, just the one thing that you feel like can impact their health or their sleep the most? Is there, other than getting enough, is there anything else that you would say is the one thing that would impact their health the most? Yeah, I mean, I think it's this kind of, it's getting enough, but then it's also giving yourself permission to get enough. This is the number one issue that I see. So people kind of almost, even when they do know that they should get more sleep, they're still battling with the social context. Is it okay? Can I stop what I'm doing to get to get more sleep? Can I, can I say it's okay? I'm going to bed early. Can I tell my guests when they're around, you know what, you have to leave now. I'm going to bed. I'm really sorry. I'll be rubbish tomorrow, but don't go to bed now. Right. It's about giving ourselves permission to do that. That's the number one thing I see that people have to get over as a hurdle. Wow. That's true. Like actually like setting boundaries with others to protect yourself and your well being. That's so good. Um, so I know you're over in the UK and I'm in the U S how can people find you? I mean, how, how can we get your services here? I mean, is that possible? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so I work online, so it's totally possible. I do, I do, um, online coaching. Um, I'm on Facebook It's Nikki Blakeman sleep coaching. I have a podcast called how to sleep where I talk about some of these things in detail and break them down into nice bite-sized um, bite-sized episodes so you can come at them, you know, when you're, when you're busy and are tired. I know most of my clients are really busy. Um, and I'm on Instagram as well, Nikki.Blakeman. So yeah, come and follow me. And if you need me, just reach out. For definite. Don't, don't, please don't ever accept a sleep problem and suck it up like I did. I wasted years of good, <laughs> happy so, life. I'm with you. Well, thank you so much for talking today. I had, a, I think we had an awesome conversation. I learned a lot and I hope we, you know, enhance the lives of, lives of others because I mean, this is so crucial for our health and well-being. So thank you. Thank you a lot for being with me. Thank you so much. It's been really honored to come on. I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Bye.